full stop, absolute bullshit lie. Well, you grew up in North Hollywood, like five miles from, you grew up in the same society that's based on certain enlightenment notions that are based in turn on certain notions. This is dumb, this is counterproductive, and it's, and it's intolerant because you're a, a non-meritorious, intolerant bigot. <gasps> when you are studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out? Hi, this is the Obesian Anarchist, and in this video, I want to give you simple advices and tips for informal conversations and debates about hard subjects such as politics, religion, etc. I tried to simplify to the max and select the most important points. If you've got some experience under your belt as a debater, you're likely to know a good portion of what I'm going to say here. This is meant for normal people, as I think formal debate strategies are already well covered on YouTube and aren't always useful to most people. In fact, I've seen plenty of advice that would be terrible for most people to use, but looks good on camera. And the idea that you feel it's acceptable to put a gun to my head and force me not only to give you the mashed potatoes, but to actually have me pass them to you as well is absolutely asinine, okay? Okay, well, that would be a solid argument if not for the fact that you're eating asparagus, which I made, okay? Ben, how could you seriously not pass the mashed potatoes after taking her asparagus? Is it my fault she gave it away for free and lost all leverage? I'm trying to teach my child how to compete and succeed within the free market, okay, folks? Good, good guy, guy, folks. I didn't realize I was surrounded by communists. I have the mashed potatoes and the asparagus because I make good decisions, okay, folks? It's also capital that you understand that this is not a guide to own your political enemy with overwhelming sophistry, but a set of easy to follow rules to get more out of those type of discussions, but also to control the tension and avoid a situation where words would spin out of control and a relationship is broken. Or even if it just means a conversation that could have been interesting won't happen. This is my own synthesis of a bunch of stuff from street epistemology. See this YouTube channel, the link should be here on the screen. From the Socratic method and to a lesser extent from various readings in rhetoric, marketing, psychology and sociology. I built my technique talking in real life and online to people from all around the world of any race, gender, political leaning or walk of life. A Catholic philosopher, a blue collar conservative, a liberal school teacher, a critical race scholar, a neo-nazi drug addict or even a communist anime fan. Nobody's too different or too wrong that I wouldn't want to talk to them. Maybe you've got stricter limits or a specific goal and that for you to figure out, but these 10 rules I chose so that you could use them in any circumstances with anyone. They aren't bulletproof, but if you don't already know them, they can still make things much easier. If you want more videos like this, let me know. On my to-do list for the topics, I've got tips for normal liberals, tips for normal conservatives that will focus on more specific errors and more advanced stuff like focuses on specific situations, fallacies, strategies, etc. If you have ideas, don't hesitate to share. 1. Misdirected priorities Get your uh, priorities in order. Know yourself, know what you want to do and take the steps so it happens. A lot of people bull rush into debate without knowing what the goal is, what are their chances of winning and what they want to communicate. Most of it comes down to people mimicking academic rhetorical debate or internet response format in situations where it won't work and you likely look like a douchebag or an idiot. In most regular life situations, you want to go into any conversation with a win-win mindset. Meaning, don't engage feeling too much, be relaxed and don't try to save face if you're wrong, you're wrong. As the goal of any person-to-person -person debate should be to exchange 
ideas and sort out which one had the best. That way, everybody discussing can quote-unquote win the debate, since regardless of who's wrong or right, both can learn something. That doesn't mean you can't joke or do some sarcasm, but it means if your goal is gratuitous humiliation or preaching and converting or playing some scripted political confrontation, don't expect anything productive to happen. Humans often react poorly to ideological differences, and it's easy to adopt a posture that breaks the equality and reciprocity of the situation. So remember, unless it's your kid, you're not here to educate. Unless it's your church, you're not here to preach. And unless it's your mortal enemy, you're not here to war. To ask questions. Asking questions is never a bad idea. If you don't know something, instead of assuming, ask. If you're not sure, ask. If you don't understand, ask. All that is important. But there is actually a way to have a conversation mostly through questions. Yeah. Do you, do you like that situation? I mean, I do. you're comfortable believing on things on faith? Mm -hmm. What is your definition of faith? Do you have a definition of it? Uh, I guess just trusting in something that you can't see. Trusting what you can't see. Do you trust in things that you can't see in things unrelated to the God belief? Yeah. This is called the Socratic method, or for a modern version, street epistemology. Anyway, it consists in asking questions to make the other think. This is different from a rhetorical question. We have to ask ourselves. What's the best way to grow the economy and create jobs? Should we keep tax loopholes for oil companies? Or should we use that money to give small business owners a tax credit when they hire new workers? Because we can't afford to do both. Should we keep tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires? Or should we put teachers back to work so our kids can graduate ready for college and good jobs? which is when you make an argument in the form of a question, but you don't really expect an answer. A true Socratic question should be honest and be said by somebody who both wants to know the answer and is ready to receive any answer. Instead, ask questions to know how people know what they know and why they believe what they believe. Because then they can question things for themselves instead of through your input of information, your biases, etc. This is very useful if you don't have much time to think into getting better at debate, as do most people. You just need to learn to refrain a bit from judgment and asserting yourself, and it requires to listen. But that's it. It also requires that you accept that where they end up is not where you end up often. No complicated framing techniques, no facts and statistics to remember, no rhetorical strategies, none of those things that do or scare or limit people with regards to hard conversations. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've used some of the same techniques talking to my, my father who loves Donald Trump. Like when he'll say something, like, well, how do you know that? Excellent. Why, why that? How is it going by using that technique as opposed to something that you've done in the past? He's actually observed that he felt the conversation was more effective for him. <laughs> he, at the end, he said, you know, that was way better than when I talked to someone who's more aggressive, I think is the word he used. Mm. Yeah, so he, he volunteered that he thought the conversation was more productive. And I, and I agree. Wonderful. Because, you know, I didn't tell him, oh, you're wrong. I just said, well, how do you know that? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Like, mm. could, couldn't it be something else? Yeah, we were, we were talking, for example, about, um, I think it was the, the steel tariffs we were talking about, right? Oh, okay. And you were talking about how, you know, Japan has always had tariffs on U.S. cars. Like, well, maybe it's because their industry relies on vehicles. Maybe there's a reason they have it. It's not vindictive. It's they're trying to support their economy, which is why, they, and I, I assumed, I didn't challenge them on the fact of it. I said, well, couldn't there be a reason they're doing that? Mm. Yeah, and so he thought, oh, I never thought of that. 
Interesting. That's great. Yeah. yeah, I think you'll probably get more traction in your conversations if you use questions as opposed to giving him brute facts. Right. Ask him to explain his position and how he got yeah. there. Yeah. Good for you. That's yeah. great. Personally, I favor mixing a bunch of different techniques for maximum flexibility and depending on the situation. Typically, in my experience, the Socratic method requires three things. That you got the full attention of the interlocutor, that they are not trying to test you or uh, socially dominate you, and finally, that they understand why you are asking all those questions. You can try to solve the truth first by continuing to ask questions, but I think framing the fourth point is more efficient. Anyway, if you want to do full Socratic, it may require you to give up on such situations, which is okay. And the last problem simply requires you to be honest and not pushy. Otherwise, you look sneaky, which can look even worse than just being a belligerent asshole. 3. The problem of good faith and bad faith. Never assume either good faith or bad faith unless you have a clear proof of any of the above. Troll exists, but in my experience from talking to strangers on the internet, there are really few and far between. But if you are unsure, ask, do you honestly believe that? Or did you come to this conclusion? More often than not, you can deduce from the answer or lack of answer whether it was a troll or not. Most people do act and think mostly in good faith and believe what they believe because they think it is true and want what they want in politics because they think it is good. Do not assume people who disagree with you are all evil or malevolent. They can be wrong and so can you. There is nothing evil in that. Lots of people also have a little bit of bad faith, I'd say even most people. But unless you have none of it and never have, be understanding. Anyway, if you are persistent, you can change someone from bad faith to good faith. Often people will be more defensive if they don't know whether or not you yourself are of good faith. So saying it is never a wrong idea. Look, from what I know, I have to disagree, but I'm open to being proven wrong. As for how you should act, it depends on each case. Generally, meet the tone of your interlocutor as well as their format and pacing. But if the interlocutor is of bad faith, don't forget to uh, say that you know it's the case and that you better have a conversation in good faith. Some people play uh, and they need to uh, play uh, the sort of weird tribal confrontation ritual or a fight for dominance uh, and you can't communicate with them until you've earned their respect, which is easy as long as you're relaxed and always offer to go to a more civil style of communication. Never allow the interlocutor to engage with you unless they're willing to be on equal footing. You can either flat out refuse and state you won't talk unless it's a symmetrical relationship, or try to school the teacher, enlighten the priest, or outbutter the soldier playfully. To win those games online, where they are very frequent because people don't know each other, and so they have to define the relationship from zero. Should you judge that this is the correct way for the situation, use formulations that confuse identifying you with this or that tribe. Because some words, those words, despite being technically neutral, will be associated with this or that camp. Mix them whenever possible. The goal is to establish that it is not what you want to discuss and that you are not here to represent anyone else. Still, if you choose to compete, be overly dramatic and don't shy away from 
uh, loony sentences. For if you demonstrate, you say what you want, you can't be controlled, and you don't care about face, then playing dumb games becomes pointless. Never tell a lie, though, even when you do the little fighting dance. Of course, you're perfectly free to avoid all this hassle if that's not something you're into. But I'm sure I'm not the only one who enjoys a bit of competition. Just keep your goal in mind and switch to real talk as soon as the game ends. For framing. Framing is one of the most basic debate techniques. One that can be a bit hard to master but is quite easy to use. So what is it? As the name implies, it's about defining the perimeter of your intervention. So anything that aims at defining an issue through a certain analysis, and I will add that aims at defining what you would talk about the issue in that way. So, that's selecting your vocabulary, the notions you use, the stereotypes you mobilize, the values behind your intervention, etc. Think of a good frame job as dressing up your facts so that they are presentable, because otherwise no one cares. It is often said in certain internet circles that all arguments from emotion are wrong or morally condemnable, or somehow outside the scope of a reasonable conversation. This couldn't be more wrong, and especially so in matters outside of pure science. I am not sure emotions would be welcome if we were to discuss the best manner to calculate the surface of a sphere, but if the matter is all one wants society to look like, then it definitely has its place. No, what is ethically disputable is to use framing instead of logic or to cover bad logic or false facts but, but that's called a lie and it's not specific to emotions since you can lie about the most dry of technical or scientific matters and besides if you don't have any facts to talk about at all then your talk will sound hollow to anyone besides those that already agree and don't care anymore or never cared at all about facts. That's what you see, for example, when a politician does a speech but has nothing to say and will string up buzzwords in an incoherent way and it generally sounds hollow from the outside and only the most sycophantic fans will applaud. 5. 5. Bad timing. Don't talk to people if they don't want to talk. With the people close to you, be careful and always engage them when they are open to it. I know it's sometimes hard not to correct people, but you have to choose your battles. And by the way, on the other hand, I wouldn't advise either to be silent all the time. That is a very bad way to handle a conflict, because otherwise you're just going to let it grow instead of addressing it. So, again, the name of the game will be Don't Hesitate to Ask. Do you want my opinion? Are you open to alternative explanations? With people online, you have to choose a platform. Basically, it comes to forum or social networks and both will have uh, different rhythms and paces and type of conversation, etc, etc. So, then you either find someone combative, someone who tries to engage, uh, for example, under a political topic, video or piece of media, or you put your own bait there, a very short, very simple, but quite clear-cut affirmation, or a carefully crafted, simple but hard question. No more. Six ideological biases and blindfolders. An ideological bias is when you tend to discard information, 
contrary to what you believe in and tend to believe information confirming it regardless of the reliability or truthfulness of the information. An ideological blindfolder is when you completely miss something. My point is not obviously that you should know everything and know it correctly, but you should know that you don't know everything. That there will always be things you overlooked, errors you will make, and that it's easy to get too comfortable and stop thinking that you could be wrong. This principle is called epistemological humility. Epistemology being the philosophy of knowledge. The other side of the coin is that if you're not sure about this or that fact or belief from the other, don't assume, ask when you can, sure rely on experience, but even then know that it's not perfect. 7. Relativism and refusal to engage. Don't be a relativist, be a realist. There is no ob- If there is no objective reality to get to, then there is no point in you debating or discussing anything. It's all pointless. Many people, when their case isn't going well, will default to saying something like, well, it's my truth, or it's just a matter of opinion, even when the matter was actually of facts. That's okay if you don't like those conversations and don't want to engage. But it's a terrible message to a conversation partner if you really wanted to convince them. I know most people do that to calm an uncomfortable situation. But what it says is, I will never admit when I am wrong. So... Why would anyone talk to you? If you're uncomfortable, you can say, I hear you, but I'm not sure I want to continue this conversation right now. My head's not up to the stuff. Oh, that's a good point. I still feel like I'm right, but I'll have to think about it. That's a way better message, because now you're owning up to the situation and you recognize the other's point. It's the graceful way to lose the debate. And if you want to argue that some ideology or policy is better than another, you can't be flippant about the facts and still get taken seriously on that point. You can't provide a solid demonstration, then you shouldn't be a 100% sure and you should act accordingly. You should demonstrate a level of certainty that is congruent with what you can justify to yourself. And this should be congruent with the knowledge you have. Meaning, if you can justify something to yourself, or if your justification isn't based on facts, but based on what you like or what you'd want to be true, then it's not going to work well. So, of course, you can talk about things you're not 100% sure about, or things where your evidence case is shaky. But be forward and transparent about it. There's no honor in taking certainty. On the contrary, if you want people to know you're honest, there are few better ways than being totally truthful with your degree of certainty or uncertainty. And keep in mind, you're not... Uh, uh, Ben Shapiro or whomever talking to uh, another public figure in front of an audience. You're a normal person. So, especially if you're talking with someone close to you, a friend, a family member, uh, that sort of person, then it matters more that you keep the relationship honest than you win any given debate. Even if your end goal is to convince them of something. Because you can always reopen the conversation, so when defeat isn't a big deal. And it's a way bigger deal to have your trust broken because you have not been honest 
on the long term. 8. Pacing. Pacing is very important. People don't think or process information at the same rate. From my experience, for example, I've picked up that pattern. Liberals and libertarians tend to speak and write by paragraphs, which is great to convey loads of information, but may lead to the point getting lost or the interlocutor being overloaded, while typically conservatives favor short one or two sentence lines that are straight to the point, but make it hard to convey a complex message. So that's two very different ways to communicate. Generally, the best move is to meet the interlocutor on the pacing, on message size and on speaking time, or to find a compromise between what they and you want, and then control pacing in terms of time between answers if it is online, or time between talks if it's not online. If you can clearly identify the core of the disagreement, go shorter. And if you have to explain something complex, go longer. If you don't want to waste time, ask questions. What would need to be true for you to change your mind? What do you think we disagree upon? If I were to explain you my understanding of this issue, but it is long, will you read it? Could you define what you mean by that? Then there is the problem of sources and evidence. Don't spam them, don't refuse to give them, but be smart about it. If the person is not paying enough attention or is emotional, you have to handle that first if you want your efforts to work. Don't hesitate to be direct and ask. If I were to provide proof of this statement, would you go look at the sources I present you with an open mind? Finally, pacing is also distributing your intervention on a schedule. Whether it is IRL or online, you don't want to overwhelm people or be overwhelmed yourself, and you don't want to be underwhelming either. So be strategic about changing one's mind in that regard. Some people like to have the talk and for it to be concise and limited in time, even though it might make it intense, while others will get emotional and feel attacked by that. With the last type of people, sparsing it on days can be better. Typically, when I'm online, I use that formula. In the YouTube comment section, by mail or other places where I can talk all I want, I like long forms, long paragraphs, one response a day for a few weeks, something like that. But on Twitter, you have to be more concise, find a shorter goal, and so I may not wait a full day. Don't take it as a rule. Maybe you need to find your own formula, depending on where you are and what makes sense. 9. Mishandled emotions. When the deeply held beliefs are put under scrutiny, it is natural for many humans to react with fear, as if under physical attack. What? Why that is? Hard to say. Perhaps a mechanism for conformity, testament to the harshness of being tribeless in the past, or possibly something linked to the perception of outsiders. No matter the why, this can make effective communication quite hard. The best domino to effectively exchange information is therefore to have a relaxed approach where you don't take anything personally, even if invectives are spouted, and don't think you have to win or else you lose. If you lose, after all, you win, because you were either wrong, in which case you learn the truth, or you were an ineffective debater, in which case this is an occasion to sharpen your technique. That way, you don't get angry, and you won't judge and you will be able to operate from love and compassion and never forget that you are doing that so you and other humans can progress and know truth from lie and right from wrong. But this also means that you may want to control your own physical levels of stress. Pay attention to what you are doing. Are you leaning forward, tense up, 
when you debate if yes that can be a problem as assuming an aggressive position can make you more aggressive or make you be perceived as aggressive so most often it's a good idea to literally lean back breath slow laugh joke relax your shoulder maybe even do a scroller cradle Ten and last point thinking small on the internet that's a hard one to correct but lots of people don't get the vastness of the world or at least haven't internalized it usually they do fine without it but this is key to get productive online discourse right if you want to get real good at online interactions i'd advise to always keep in mind that unless you have evidence otherwise you could be talking to anyone and that's never going to stop surprising you the same comment about marxism could be made by a chinese communist party troll by a socialist oxford student or by a marxist professor from a small american community college the same comment about religion could be made by an italian atheist or a german lutheran or a deist from pakistan or an orthodox jew from israel etc etc all will have their own beliefs and motivations biases and levels of good and bad faiths and ways of engaging or not engaging conclusion on that point we've reached the end of the list if you like the video please subscribe like and all those things if you have any comments to make whether you disagree or think i missed something or wasn't clear enough on any point please go ahead i am very interested in having your feedback and exchanging this channel is not what the algorithm wants to see so if it reaches anything it will be thanks to you and all the other people who watched and supported it this was the obvious anarchist thanks and bye bye love is wise hatred is foolish in this world which is getting more and more closely interconnected we have to learn to tolerate each other we have to learn to put up with the fact that some people say things that we don't like we can only live together in that way and if we are to live together and not die together we must learn a kind of charity and a kind of tolerance which is absolutely vital to the continuation of human life on this planet.